Today we're going to look at uh, kind of the different labor systems, the most popular ones or the ones that College Board will be, you know, asking you about. And I've got a few quizzes throughout and then we'll compare the systems and then also look at how they, they change and stay the same over time. All right, so our little warm up today. So I have this one under poll one. So if y'all wanna go ahead and go into the polls and answer the first question. And so basically the question is, why do we celebrate Labor Day? All right, so if you wanna head over, see what we've got here. All right. Or poll. Let's see. All right. Okay. Very good. Everyone's got the right answer. Let me fix my screen here. Okay. So why do we ce celebrate Labor Day? Of course, it celebrates the working class, right? Um, and so today we're all about laborers. Um, so just a little um, throwback to what Labor Day is. Um, it started in the 1880s, so the height of the Industrial Revolution in America. Um, so if you remember, this was a time of low wages, long hours, low pay, right? Kind of the classic sweatshop working in the factories, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, um, child labor, kids working in the mines, unsafe conditions. Of course, we're not quite here with our uh, world history, but this is you know, probably something we all kind of already have some prior knowledge. So September 5th, 1882, 10,000 workers marched in New York from City Hall to Union Square, um, kind of more as a protest, like we're going to take a day off, we're going to raise awareness for our situation, and um, it kind of sticks. And then several cities decide to give a Labor Day and kind of celebrate the worker, and so that's that's where we're going with that. All right. Okay. So what is a labor system? Well, you know, labor means work, right? So a laborer is a worker and, um, you know, pretty basic, but sometimes, you know, when you've got the tricky wording on the AP test, you know, my students freeze up and they're like, I didn't know what it was talking about. And it's like, it's workers. You got this, you know, this. Um, so what's a labor system? So it's really the relationship between the workers and the employee. And so um, what rights and responsibilities does each side have? And so different systems, you know, will have different rights and responsibilities. All right. As we go, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, the chat I can see really fast. Um, the ask a question, I'll have to go in there, but, but either way works. Um, Okay, so we've got what a labor system is, um, kind of a basic definition. So let's see, let's look at some types. Um, so free labor, so obviously the people are free, right? Um, but the workers have a choice, right? I chose to be a teacher, I'm you know, free labor system. Um, I can, you know, resign from my job. I cannot, you know, free workers can also be fired from their jobs, they can switch job fields whenever they want, or employers. So this is usually, you know, what we think of today. So some examples um, from our Titan period, and we're looking at 1200 to 1450, but I do have um, some things that do extend over into the 1450 area, so we'll get to that. So salary or wage earners. So they work for someone else and earn an hourly or daily wage. So if you're thinking of kind of salary, uh, maybe your Confucian scholars, your bureaucrats, wage earners can be, you know, in a factory um, make, making different products. Uh, but military bureaucrats, housekeepers, right? Um, now, artisans are a little bit different. They don't work for someone else. They create and sell their own products. Merchants, of course, buy and sell products. Um, they don't actually create anything. Uh, remember, this is kind of why the Chinese don't really like merchants, because they don't make their own product. They just kind of make, they profit off someone else's. Uh, farmers farm their own land, sell the crops. Um, there's some different systems where farmers won't own their own land, but this would be in kind of a free labor system. Okay, so 
these are not the interesting systems, right? Um, but before we move on to that, okay, I've got this really crazy picture. Uh, anyone know what this guy is here? What his job is from the Middle Ages? If you do, go ahead and put that in the chat. See if y'all have gotten to that part of history yet. Or maybe if you play Assassin's Creed, you probably know what this scary guy does. All right, anybody? Okay. Okay, so this is our doctor during the Black Plague. So he would be a free worker. Um, so uh, during the Black Plague, um, they thought that the plague was spread through the air. And so the doctor's fully covered and he's got this, this mask that he would put um, roses or posies in there that smelled good to kind of cover up the scent. Okay. All right. So let's move on to the good stuff. All right. So, um, so coerced labor is really what's more interesting and more of what is going to be on the AP test. So uh, free labor, you know, we've got peasants, farmers, artisans, all of that kind of thing. But coerced labor is usually kind of the more interesting systems um, that, that we're looking for. All right, so what is coerced labor? Well, coerced means to force. So forced labor by an individual or the state. So perhaps the government is forcing people to do certain work. Um, so workers don't choose this job, right? They cannot resign. They cannot change positions or locations or bosses or, you know, any of that. And so forced labor can be temporary for a short time or it can be permanent. And uh, the picture I have up here, this is um, obviously this is from much later time frame, but this is convict labor. So in the old days, you could um, hire out prisoners in the United States and they would go and do things like it looks like they're building a railroad here. So, so that would definitely fall into our coerced labor. All right. Okay. So employers and workers have different rights and responsibilities depending on the system of coerced labor. So um, some are going to be a little bit better systems. Workers will have more rights, but if it's forced, they already don't have a whole lot of rights. Um, but let's look at the different systems and, and see what we have going on. Okay, well, before we get there, can you think of any examples of forced labor? What, what am I talking about here? Go ahead and put that in the chat. Anything thinking of forced labor? All right. Thanks, Donald. Okay, slavery in any part of the world. Slavery again. Okay, good. Oh, the Aztecs with conquered people. Yes, awesome. Okay, all right. You guys already know everything. Um, okay, so slavery. All right, I was figuring we'd come up with slavery. Um, so uh, obviously that's going to be one that's going to come to mind. And so this will be really useful on your AP exam, but then we'll want to bring in some of the, the other systems too. So, okay, so why do we have slavery? Why do we have these other four systems? Well, one of the biggest things is it, it's basically due to a labor shortage, right? Um, so if we, um, sorry about all the US examples, we'll get to the world examples too. But if you think about the United States, when they start importing African slaves, it's because they needed more workers to farm the tobacco fields in the United States. So they kind of, so different areas need this um, supply of workers, right? And so they, they want to kind of get this constant cheap labor supply. And slavery is, is one way to ensure that, that you have workers. Um, so what about, is there an event maybe in history that maybe you've covered in your class that you think, might cause a labor shortage where you need more workers. Any ideas on that? If you have an idea, you could put that in the chat. Ah, the Black Death. Okay, awesome. 
I was hoping you were going to go with that one. Yes, so that definitely causes a labor shortage, and we'll see what system we get in that time frame. Okay, so I want to go back. Um, oh, and discovery in the new world. Awesome. So um, I want to go back to the nomads. So when we start looking at, like, how does slavery develop? Um, and I think the idea of it changes as we as we go through time. Okay, so our first labor system is slavery. And so your nomads or your pastoral people, um, they tended to have more social and gender equality. So you might think that they might not have slaves, but some will take slaves after warring with other tribes, right? So they did kind of fight over territory, even though they're migratory. Um, now, they're often known for taking the survivors as slaves. So um, if we're thinking of nomads, think of, you know, North American, Native Americans, they um, are in small bands, right? So if they conquer a neighboring small tribe and there's some, you know, women and children left, a few people can't really survive on their own, right? They need to be part of a bigger group when we're talking about hunters and gatherers, right? So typically what they did is they would bring those survivors into their tribe, but they're obviously, you know, probably not really wanting to, you know, gel with their conquerors, right? They probably, you know, just, uh, you know, killed most of their relatives. And so when we see outsiders writing about this, they say they were taken slaves and they were held there. Um, but what's really happening is they're really becoming kind of assimilated into the tribe. Um, and basically everyone has to work in the tribe for, for it to survive, right? And so we've got some tales of, of captives and they're like, they enslaved me. Um, but I think they just didn't understand that, well, you're here, yeah, we're holding you captive, but you gotta work, we all work, we've gotta do that. Um, okay, so Cabeza de Vaca, one of our Spanish explorers who came to Texas, he was enslaved by some of the Native Americans and uh, he writes in his journal, I couldn't, I couldn't find the quote, but he writes about how you know they made him work and carry buckets of water and um, I think he just wasn't used to hard work, okay. So this, so there's some roots of slavery, right, um, from the dawn of time. So whether this is kind of, this is probably a little bit different idea of slavery than what we think of. Um, so let's go a little bit later in time. So um, if we're thinking of like our Romans, our Greeks, right, all the way um, to discovery of Americas, right, these are kind of the standards of, of slavery. So as empires expand, they, um, you know, through military conquest, they start to take a lot of slaves. And the prisoners of war generally become slaves. So when you conquer a foreign army, you know, you're worried about, okay, I conquer, so say Rome conquers North Africa, right? They conquer the Phoenicians and, um, or the Carthage, it's Carthage, right? <laughs> they conquer um, North Africa and those surviving uh, soldiers often become prisoners of war because they don't want them to rebel, right? You don't want that army you just conquered to kind of rise up and rebel. So we're gonna see lots of prisoners of war, lots of soldiers um, become slaves. So this mosaic is uh, from ancient Rome. And so if you've ever seen the movie Gladiator, um, so one kind of extreme of slavery is the gladiator. So the Emperor Nero thought it would be fun to you know, capture people and have them fight lions and tigers and each other. And so this is where slavery becomes this twisted form of entertainment. We've got that. But so very few people are probably going to fall into that boat, let's hope. Um, but again, the conquering the armies um, will definitely become slaves. And they usually did um, often hard work building roads or um, buildings, stuff like that, but they could have any kind of job. Um, now, your common person often went into slavery because of debt. So, you know, we've got our credit cards and, you know, 
do a balance transfer and all kinds of other <laughs> tricky accounting that you know I may or may not have done in the past. Um, but in the ancient world, if you had a high debt and you couldn't pay it, you could enter into slavery, right? Not, I guess, sell yourself. You could go into slavery. Um, you could actually send your wife or your kids to work off that debt for you as well. So how about that? Um, but this is pretty common, right? You work enough time to pay off that debt. Um, so this will be more of a temporary, uh, temporary forced employment. Um, so when your debt's paid off, you know, you'll have a clear time of, okay, I've got to work so many months or years to pay off this debt. Um, and so slaves in the ancient world, um, they were often very educated. Sometimes they had really high ranking jobs, um, tutors for your children, um, were often slaves, um, and then others are treated horribly, right? You, you know, could be like the gladiators, or you could be doing heavy farm work or or other work. So there was there was a wide range. Now, some differences. Um, well, slavery is very common. Um, so these are differences from when we think of like the African slave trade uh, that comes to the Americas, and I'm not going to go too much into that. But I know we all have an idea of that. So we're always kind of comparing that in our head. But slavery was very common. Most in most areas, slaves could buy their freedom. Um, so, you know, not all places or not all slaves will be able to. But um, there was an idea of, yeah, you can go work for someone on the side and eventually you'll buy your freedom. Um, Often slaves were freed at a young enough age to have a family and save for retirement. So that's also a difference from what happens in the Americas when um, in the Americas, when they start to own slaves for life, you know, if you free someone at age 75, what are they going to do? You know, they're too old to work. Um, so when George Washington freed um, his slaves, many of them he set up with like a pension because he knew um, you know, they wouldn't, there was no one to take care of them, right? And they were too old to work. Um, children of slaves were typically free, right? And especially if you're working off a debt, right? You're just working off that debt and then you're, you know, you have kids, they're going to be free. Um, it was definitely not based on race. So as you start to get into the, the later time period in your class and we look at that transatlantic slave trade, you're, that's going to add on that element of race. And then they may or may not be allowed to marry. Um, I took a lot of classes in college on ancient Rome, and they typically didn't let them marry because, you know, the slaves were there to work. So if you were a housekeeper or something within the household, like they needed you to do that job. But it depends on location. The Greeks, the Romans, the Persians, they all had different systems. Okay. All right. Everybody with me so far? Okay. So um, Greeks, Romans, Persians are a little bit earlier than what we're thinking of. So we're thinking of 1200 to 1450. We've got Africa, China, India, the Americas, Europe, Middle East. So let's see what we're thinking. So there's two of those areas had very few slaves. So go ahead and take it to the polls and uh, in poll two. Let's see um, if you know which two areas have the fewest amount of slaves. Okay, so let me see if anybody's put anything in here. Okay, I'm seeing, all right, looks good. Thanks for participating. Okay, um, so yes, you guys are right. India and China had the, the fewest amount of slaves. So. Uh, Middle East and Europe are going to have quite a few African Americas, depending on the area. And so that leads me to any ideas on why those two areas have the fewest amount of slaves? All right, so that would be poll three. Okay, let's check this out. Okay, got a couple votes in there. Okay, all right, you guys have got this. This is too easy. Okay. Um, yeah, they had a plentiful uh, supply of labor. And so 
if there's one thing you take away from today, the reason we have labor systems is to supply, uh, you know, keep that labor supply going. Okay, and so China and India, um, they have a huge populations, right? They have big populations today, they had them back then. But in India, you have the caste system, and so you had plenty of people in those lower castes to kind of do that work. And then in China, there were plenty of peasants to farm and do all kinds of other jobs. Okay, so let's go to the Americas first. And so if we're looking at North America, so Canada and uh, the United States area, there wasn't a whole lot of need for slaves. So, you know, these are smaller bands of, you know, migratory American Indians. Um, so they really didn't have much slavery, although there are stories of like assimilating the captives. And so um, there might be some slaves, right? Um, the one place where there is evidence of slavery is in Cahokia. And so um, hopefully you guys rem uh, remember these guys with the, um, okay, I keep losing my PowerPoint here. <laughs> um, so with the mound builders, right? They build these serpentine mounds and then uh, we think these are some kind of, you know, ceremonial mounds. So um, they did have a large enough amount of people to need some workers. Okay, now Mesoamerica is a little bit different. So we're thinking Central America here. So uh, Mexico, um, Belize, Guatemala, right? Yucatan Peninsula, um, and at Mayans and Aztecs, right? That's who we're thinking of our time frame. Well, they did have slavery. And so they did have a need for this labor supply. Um, all right, okay, so in our chat, what do you think the Aztecs or the Mayans needed a lot of people to do? Is there something that might, you know, they wanna do something, let's see. Growing crops and sacrificial victims, awesome. Um, yes, those are both right. Uh, is there anything that they might have wanted to build? they did build. Like two seconds. Oh, the city on the lake and pyramids. Awesome. Okay, good. Yeah, so they do, they are, they're going to need people for all of these things. All right, so um, let's think of the Aztecs, right? Um, Mayans and Aztecs had a lot of the same traditions. Um, not quite interchangeable, but so if we think of the Aztecs, right, prisoners of war, of course, who they didn't sacrifice, right? So um, if you don't get sacrificed to the gods, um, you're probably, you know, going to be a slave. And again, it's the same reasons, right? They don't want that military to rebel and rise up. Um, and so that might be more of the harsher job, building those pyramids um, and debtors, right? So they also had this debt system. So I really find it very interesting that, you know, these two worlds, the Americas and Afro-Eurasia, they didn't have any connections yet. They come up with these same systems, right? Um, okay, so let's look at the the relationship, right? So the rights of, of the slaves and the owners. So in the Aztec world, slaves could marry, uh, they could have children. Um, I believe the children were free. Um, yes, they are. Uh, they could buy freedom, buy their own freedom. Uh, when the master died, they were free. So you don't inherit slaves, right? And if we think of, you know, Thomas Jefferson, right? That's one of the big things that he, um, he left to his daughter were, were his slaves. Now the owners, um, they have to give shelter, food, clothing, and they are not allowed to sell the slaves. So especially um, if it's a debt that they're working off, you know, they've got to work off that debt and then they're, they're, they're done. They are not to be passed off to someone else. Okay, so moving on. Um, so those are kind of the ins and outs, right, of slavery with the Aztecs. All right, so let's move on to the African slave trade. All right, so this is where I find things are really interesting because, again, we've got a lot of prior knowledge of the transatlantic African slave trade, um, but right now that hasn't happened, right? That's gonna happen after 1450. But so 
actual Africans started and ran their own slave trade, right? This has been going on for thousands of years. And again, it's those same old reasons, prisoners of war. Um, okay. Oh, connections that are trans-Saharan trade. Yes. And of course, um, yeah. And guys, chime in if you have questions or if you want to add on or, um, you know, kind of enrich, feel free to type that in the chat so we can all um, learn from each other. Um, so yeah, I really like this map because it's it's showing the, the trans-Saharan uh, routes and we know they traded gold and salt, but they also transported slaves and we can see um, you know, uh, most of the slaves are kind of coming from West Africa, but they're going to go into uh, the Middle East, right? They'll go up into Europe and, you know, all over the place. Okay. Um, so again, same thing, prisoners of war. And um, so there's some that are taken for that trade, but Others, like, it's often raids on enemy villages, right? And so, again, you've got people competing for land and in area and long-time feuds. And so they often would raid each other, these neighboring groups. And so for some, it was they needed workers, right? And so they kind of go take their enemy neighbors and have them work for a while, and then often they let them go, right? Um, find it kind of weird but um yeah but we can we have evidence we see evidence of this happening um now others um you know as prisoners of war are taken with this slave trade with eurasia all right now when it's kind of the villages raiding other villages um they were often freed right they're close to their families they know their families you know not too far away um, they are not considered chattel. So chattel basically means property, right? Um, and so we always think of that, you know, Atlantic slave trade where this, that's where slaves become the chattel or the property. And so, um, so that'll come in a later time frame. Uh, but in Africa, when it's kind of those villages, right, um, we're kind of borrowing you. I don't think it makes it any better, but taking them for a short time, um, but with the intent of, hey, I hope I can free this free this person, you know, and hopefully they won't come back and raid my village and do the same to me. But then um, there's others that will come in, they see there's a lot of warring in these kind of prisoners of war, and they will take those slaves, you know, across the Mediterranean or through the Indian Ocean. Now, your Islamic, uh, Islamic caliphates and the sultanates um, from our Islamic world will take over much of the uh, slave trade when they um, come in on the scene. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so let's go to our Islamic caliphates. So Islam does allow slavery. Um, now, Muslims are not supposed to enslave other Muslims, but it's perfectly fine to enslave Christians or any other infidels. Um, okay. Oh, Eric, thanks. We've got our stream on the trans-Saharan slave trade in a few days coming up. Um, so that'll be good. Let's see if um, um, they go over some of this slave trade and hopefully enhance that and add to it. And then you can, you know, show your talents by getting some quiz questions right on that one. Um, oh, Donald's, Donald's doing this one. Awesome. Okay. I'll, I'll tune into yours too. Um, all right. So, um, so Islam does allow slavery, right? We often see very religious people with slaves. Um, now, typically you should not enslave other Muslims. So once you know, slaves were taken, they often converted to Islam in hopes of being freed. And there's many cases where they do get their freedom and then there's others where like, oh, I can't free you just yet, you know, give me some time to find some other workers. And so it just kind of depends on the area and, and who has you know, purchased the slave. But Again, that African slave trade is very lucrative, right? Well before your Europeans get in on the slave trade. Okay. Again, um, soldiers are often, you know, part of this trade. 
Now, your Islamic empires are going to do something very different. They start to work these um, soldiers into their own military. And so that's actually going to develop a new uh, forced labor system. But let's see. Now, I know some of y'all started your course at 1200, so you didn't do the, you know, the Romans and the Greeks and um, some of these kind of prior empires, and some of y'all started probably with Neolithic Revolution, so you may or may not know this one, but if you do, go ahead and throw this in the chat. Uh, what pre-1200 empire allowed the conquered military into their own military? They work in, you know, it was conquered sites. Okay, the Mongols, yeah, the Mongols did that too. Um, I was thinking of someone else, but I know the Mongols are good. What about the Persians? Didn't the Persians also work in the soldiers? Um, so not so not a new idea, uh, but the Islamic empires are going to expand this. Okay. Here. Ah, okay, poll four. Which of the following are the main reasons for using slavery as a labor system? Okay, this is our check for understanding to make sure um, you guys are paying attention and we've got the main kind of idea down. Okay, Persian, Safavid Empire. I thought it was the Persians well before the Safavids, um, but they may have also done that too. Uh-oh. Um, I'm going to gonna have to go research that a little bit. But um, so these kind of bigger details, you know, um, oh, the Mamluks. Yes, yes, we're getting we're getting to them. OK, awesome. You guys are so smart. Um, oh, Persians may have outlawed the slavery. Darius. OK, because I know, didn't they? Um, free the, the Jews from captivity? Did they free all slavery? Okay, well, that will I'll have to go brush up on that. Um, but good thing Persians aren't on your AP test. So, okay, I'll get out of this little nerd chat and get to the real stuff that is on your test. Okay, so our main reasons for slavery, uh, using slavery as a labor system um, is B and C, right? So remember, it keeps conquered armies from rebelling. And then it's also a way to work off debt. All right. Okay. All right. You're with me so far. Okay. And that brings us to our Mamluks, right? Okay. So if you don't know, um, so Mamluks are slave soldiers. Um, it's buried in the library. Oh, that is waptastic. Okay. Um, the, the chat is fantastic if you guys aren't looking at it. Okay. So the Mamluks were uh, slave soldiers, right? So um, often conquered uh, soldiers worked into, you know, the conquered military. Um, but also they were just taken as young kids. So let's read uh, this passage I found. Should I get my pointer? Is that going to make it? That's going to make it harder to read. Okay. In the past, many Muslim rulers have had the following practices regarding the training of military slaves. After young male slaves had been bought for government service, they would be given gradual advancement in rank according to their length of service, education, skill, and general merit. Thus, after a gullum, which means slave, had been bought, he would serve on foot as an assistant to a cavalry man for one year. After that, he would be given a horse and trained to ride for three more years. By his fourth year, he would receive a quiver of arrows in a bow case and would start training to shoot and fight. With each passing year of loyal service, his rank and honors would be increased, as would his responsibilities. He would become a troop leader, and finally, when he turned 35 years of age, and assuming he had served the ruler honorably in every respect, he would be appointed governor of a province or would become minister. Unfortunately, this system has not been followed by rulers lately. Okay, so a golem is a slave soldier, and um, so this is coming from the advisor to one of the Seljuk Turks that took, is gonna take over after the Abbasid Empire. So this system is military conscription. So when we hear the word conscription, we think of draft, right? So, you know, most countries will draft uh, citizens into their armies. 
But this is a more extensive system where they went out and got, took young men, right? And so they can't be Muslim. Um, and so we'll see they're often Christian or Jewish or other religions. And so maybe around 13, 14, 15, they take them for the purpose of training them into the military, right? And um, one of the interesting things is, you know, they were able to move up in rank, right? So they would start as a foot soldier, then could be a cavalryman, and ultimately governor of a province or a minister. So often these um, soldiers were very, um, this was a good job to have, right? Okay, I've got some more details on the next slide. Okay, now, um, if you do tune in to the multiple choice practice questions on Thursday, that passage is gonna come back up. So I'm gonna add that one in there. Okay, so the uh, Mamluk Sultanate uh, is gonna conquer and rule Egypt until the Ottomans come in. So you've got your Seljuk Turks that come down and to Saudi Arabia, and then your Mamluks are gonna come in in North Africa. Um, Again, Mamluk means own, so this they would take the slave soldiers, and this would be quite common in um, many of the different Islamic empires. Um, so now your Mamluks, we'll kind of go specifically with them. Um, they would generally take boys from Central Asia, so there's kind of the, the steppes of Central Asia where our Mongols are from, um, Southern Russia, and the Caucasus. And so these are definitely took kind of horse people, right? Those pastoral people um, or boys, um, they knew they'd be good with horses and probably have some fighting skills. And um, so it, it, it is slavery, right? They are being put in this military, um, but they were trained, converted to Islam, and then eventually manumitted, which of course means freed. But with all the deep military training, they often stayed in that military and were the most loyal soldiers. So the only way I can really, I guess, describe this is kind of indoctrination, right? Take them at a young age, train them, um, give them their freedom, and they, they don't, they're so far away from their family, this is the only life they know, and they become kind of these, you know, single bachelor soldiers without families, although um, they were allowed allowed to marry eventually and and you know kind of have a life but their job was with the military okay so this system is military conscription and so some some areas they will be you know kind of be slaves for life the mamluks did usually free them um but they often didn't leave they they stayed in the job so i'm not sure how kind of <laughs> how really available leaving was to them if that was an option or not. Now, one of the things to kind of look for, and I know you're early in your course, but this is going to be a big continuity with the Ottoman Empire and your, our, our next time frame, right, our post-1450 time frame, they're going to do the same thing, right? And they would mostly, or they take from all kinds of places, but they would take the boys, Christian boys, especially from Eastern Europe. That's going to start to be a trend that'll um, perhaps cause some problems, um, but they'll take the young boys and train them into their Janissary army. And they also become um, really loyal slave soldiers that also are able to work up to very high, very high positions. So, all right. So we always want to kind of think of those um, changes and continuities in systems. And this is definitely a continuity to look at. Okay. Everyone still with me here? All right. Um, any questions on conscription or slavery? So let's go to the Mita system in South America. All right. So you probably already know who we're talking about with those pictures. So this one I find really interesting. Um, so the Mita system is the Incan system of public service. So it is forced labor, but it's not slavery. So instead of, so every country, right, you've got to do your part, right? Um, so in the United States, you know, we pay taxes, we obey the laws, right? Those are things that we do for our country. But with the Incans, instead of paying taxes, 
you would work for the government for so many days a year. And so that's the MITA system that maybe um, 20, 30 days a year, you've got to go and work. And so um, some of the things they did were they might, if you're a farmer, you'd go farm. And so the Incan emperors would have fields that, you know, to feed the palace. They need to have fields to kind of feed the elderly and the widows and, and people who couldn't work for themselves. Um, and so, so how can they kind of provide that service and food to the people? Well, they get you to farm it, right? Um, so you might be farming um, lots of building roads, right? So building these roads up through the Andes Mountains is going to take a lot of people and a lot of time and a lot of maintenance. And so that's probably some of the work you'll be, you would be doing if you were in this system. Again, working the silver mines or the gold mines. Um, now, when you got to pay your service, and I'm not sure exactly how many days it is, but um, it's a set number of days. Um, people pretty much willingly went, right? It's kind of, we all do it. It's fine. We'll, we'll do it. We'll get it over with each year. But your family was taken care of. So if they did, if you were a farmer and they did have to pull you during harvest season, uh, har they try not to pull you during harvest season, but if they did, you know, they would make sure, you know, your family is fed and, and things like that. So it truly is kind of that public service. Now today, many um, countries require every citizen to serve a year or two in the military. And so uh, I think in Italy, I don't know if they still do it, but I think you have to serve it by the age 26. You've got to go serve your year, right? And so um, so it's not, not an unheard of system. And again, the government took care of your family. Travel was paid by the government, right? If you've got to kind of work far away. Um, and so kind of the system with this or the ideology is ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. So of course, JFK, you know, said that to us, but um, we're gonna put this in the coerced labor system. But um, when we look at how the Incans did it, it, it was that kind of service, right? We'll do it, right? We love our country, our country takes care of us. Um, and it wasn't seen as slavery. Now, there's gonna be some definite changes to this system. Okay, so, some continuity. So when the Spanish conquered the Incans, they they really like this Mita system, and they're like, how can we how can we use this to our advantage? So when the Spanish conquer, they're going to go ahead and keep that, but they're going to change it. And so so your continuity, the Mita system stays, but the change this is the big one. So they basically force the indigenous people to work in the mines. Um, they would have some other jobs, but the mines were the big one, right? So um, kind of spoiler alert, the Spanish, they discovered the Americas in hopes of finding gold and silver and riches. And they do find that. They find that in um, the Aztec and Incan territories. And so um, now with the Incan, every citizen did it. Now people they conquered, right? They had a vast empire. The conquered people had to serve, their own citizens had to serve, but with the Spanish, it's just the indigenous. And so that's going to create a lot of tension between the conquered and the conquerors, right? And it often becomes a permanent job, like, hey, oh, you're mining for us. And um, they were paid very low. So it wasn't for free, right? So the Spanish would say, oh, let's, let's it's not anything like slavery. We pay these guys, but they were paid. You know, it wasn't even enough to live off of, right? And so they're basically forced to come work in the mines and with very low pay and sometimes other jobs too. Uh, and they had to pay their own expenses, right? Uh, and then it was like, you just need to stay here. And um, the family was kind of left to fend for themselves. Um, now the Spanish also brought the Mita from South America up to Central America, which they did not have this system, right? The Aztecs didn't do this. And so um, it'll be brought to Mexico. And so people 
we'll be doing that as well. Okay, all right. I'm going to speed this up so we don't go over our hour, but I think we can make it. Um, okay, so we've got slavery, we've got conscription, feudalism. All right, so feudalism is an interesting thing. So someone mentioned that after the Black Plague, um, we were, we're going to have a labor shortage. Well, feudalism is actually going to develop before the Black Plague. Um, and we'll, I'll go back to that in a second. But so feudalism is basically this labor system based on land. So here's kind of our, our dictionary definition. Um, but feudalism is where, so after the fall of Rome, um, you know, the Roman Empire falls and people kind of retreat in, into these small little kingdoms, right? They're running from invaders and have left the cities. And now what? Well, so this is where the, the king will own the land. He'll give land. So the king gives land to the nobles. The nobles give land to the knights. Okay, now we can't see on my cursor there. And then um, the knights and then come the peasants, right? And so, um, I lost my PowerPoint in my train of thought, <laughs> okay. Um, and so the peasants basically farm the land, right? So they farm the land in exchange for military protection from whatever invaders might happen or neighboring kingdoms. And so this is really a labor obligation. These peasants are obligated to farm this Lord's land. Now, Japan does something very similar. So uh, Japan will have a shogun, which is more of a military general. And as you can see, um, they give the land, the land, the land, the protection down to the serfs, and then the serfs farm, and those goods go up to the knights, to the lord, to the king. So this will be very similar. Okay, so, let's go so Rome falls. Now, Rome did have slavery, but that system's going to fall apart. Um, the population declines. The people flee to the countryside. Okay. And they still need the steady supply of cheap labor. And so this is where feudalism comes in. So somehow this is what's going to happen. Um, so your peasants are called serfs, right, under feudalism. Um, and they farm the Lord's land, right? And so this is really... It's agricultural, right? They're farming that land, um, and that's their one job. Now, they're tied to the Lord or his land, right? They can't really just get up and leave. They can't switch lords, and it becomes a, a legal system. And um, we have documents where your serfs who try to leave, you know, they can't, right? And, and they try to kind of uh, sue to leave, and they're, you know, they're stuck there. Um, so they would farm six days a week for the Lord, right? And that, that would be the Lord's crops. And then they get one day to farm their little tiny plot for their family. So it's not a great life. And they cannot own land, right? They're basically stuck on that manor with that, that Lord. Okay. All right. So um, and we can't really talk about feudalism without manorialism. So feudalism is your kind of social political system uh, based on, on the exchange of land and services. Manorialism is your economic system. So um, really like surprise and make your teachers happy by knowing which is social and which is economic. Um, but the, the manor, this is the manor, right? So this is how they, oops. Uh, in the Middle Ages was basically the farmland and then the the Lord lives in the manor house and then you've got your serfs over here and they farm the different fields and these are self-sufficient, right? So people are off in these little countrysides and you've got a church there, you've got your water, you're growing your own food and taking care of your animals and you have artisans to you know, make silverware and horseshoes and, and stuff like that. And so this is basically your serf's life, right? They stay, you know, they stay there. Now, um, so feudalism is going to develop well before that Black Plague, but the plague is instrumental in our serfs getting their, their freedom. And so the Black Plague causes a labor shortage. Um, so 
you know, they really need the farmers to farm because now there's no, there's hardly anyone farming, right? So a third to a half of the population died. And so these serfs start to get smart. They start saying, well, why don't you pay me, right? I'm not going to farm unless you pay me or you give me my own land. And so they start to, um, they revolt. So there's armed revolts, right? Farmers and knights fighting. And eventually they start to get rights and serfdom will basically die out in Western Europe, for sure. It dies out in Western Europe pretty quickly. Um, if you take AP Euro, there's a really great, um, they have a really great chapter on peasant revolts. It's awesome. Um, now, serfdom lasts a lot, lot longer in Eastern Europe. In Russia, it's not abolished until 1861. So think about that. The time of the American Civil War, right, where, you know, uh, we've got our African slaves getting their independence. Well, so are the serfs in, in Russia. Okay, that's like a, a watershed date there in those 1860s. All right, okay. You're still with me? All right, I'm going to go my full seven minutes till eight o'clock. Um, so now that the serfs are free, so think about after 1450, the serfs are free. Well, where will Europeans get their cheap, steady supply of labor? Where do you think they're going to turn to? So if you want to answer, oh, Brazil still had slaves until 1888. And I think they're the long, the, the last, right? I think they're one of the, the latest to get free. Oh, indentured servants. Okay, good choice. Um, uh, would they go to Africa? Yeah, so then we're going to start to get African slaves. Um, you will have indentured servants, uh, which should be... I'll come back to them. Um, so you'll have some indentured servants going throughout Europe, um, but yeah, they're going to start to turn to slaves as well. But you still have plenty of people who are going to farm, right? So you're still going to kind of have that peasant, but they're not tied to the land. Okay, encomienda. All right, so this one's a little bit post-1450, but I would feel bad if we didn't mention it. So, because um, in the Americas, you're going to have mita and then encomienda. So, um, so after the Spanish conquer, they need workers, right? And so your Spanish, when they're off conquering the Americas, they bring men, right? They bring the military, but they've got to eat. And so, um, they start, well, who are our workers going to be? And they try with the Native Americans. And so the encomienda system, it's a labor system, uh, where a Spanish encomendero, which is basically a lord, is granted land and native laborers are supposed to work his land in return for protection. So does this sound familiar at all? <laughs> and so the laborer is legally bound to that encomendero or that lord, right? And so basically we've got something very similar to feudalism. And so um, we'll see in Mexico, there isn't a whole lot of African slavery because they have plenty of workers with the encomienda system and the Mita system. Okay. Ah, indentured servitude. I know I had it in here somewhere. Um, okay. Sorry, we're going through these kind of fast. Um, so this will be more prominent also after those 1450s. And um, again, this is a debt bondage, but this one is voluntary. It's so crazy. Um, so here a laborer signs a contract to work for a master for so many years. Um, so why, why might you do this? So one of the big things we're gonna start to see is they're working off their passage to the Americas or to a different country. And so, you know, you're poor, you're starving, there's new opportunities in the Americas or different parts of the British empire, but you don't have enough money to get there. So someone will pay your boat ride over and then you owe them work. And so the Americas did this a lot. And I want to say the common uh, contract was for 10 years. And so when you think of early Jamestown, uh, most people actually died before their contract was up. So they never quite got their freedom. Um, so this is how a lot of our immigrants come to the Americas. Um, 
many Indians, Indians from India will come to the Caribbean or other parts of the British Empire through this system. And this goes well into the 1800s as well. Um, they're free people, they have rights, you know, they're not slaves, so you can't um, hurt them, you know. Um, not to say that there wasn't some different forms of, of abuse, right? But they must work the length of the contract. And so um, in US history, there's a lot of tales of the indentured servants running away before their contract is over. And of course, if you think of early America, you know, they can probably kind of spread out and not get caught and then just, you know, kind of start up their own farm. So that'll happen. Okay, what do we have? Um, so they've got to work their contract, but then the master has got to pay the passage, shelter, clothe them, feed them, uh, feed the servant, um, until, you know, their, their service is up. And sometimes they give them like a little bonus at the end. It just depended on your worker there or your owner, not owner, master. Okay. All right. Last quiz. Okay. Any questions so far? Um, sorry about rambling on in the beginning and then we've got to cover the others really fast, but those are the big labor systems, right? And so, um, actually let's skip this one. Your primary reason, uh, is for steady labor supply. We've got that. So this, um, I don't know if you guys want to, this is what, um, we'll connect the, um, slides to this. So if you do have um, Fiveable Plus, you can get the slides and kind of take a better look at this. But if you're going to get um, a long essay question or a short answer, um, we have this would be a good one, is comparing the labor systems. And so um, I took the two that I thought had a lot of similarities. So feudalism and then encomienda. Um, so with both, the workers are tied to that lord or um, agricultural work primarily. Um, they both replace the need for slavery in those areas. The the thing that the the workers get is you know protection from invasion, and then um, they're both part of a social stratification system. So feudalism, um, if you remember in the definition, it said a social system. So it's also social classes that people are born into. So you're born as a peasant and you can't move up. For many years, you could not move up. You know, you, you can't just become a knight. You're a peasant. You've got to stay there in that class. And then with encomienda, when you get in that later chapter, you'll see uh, Mexico has um, like a caste system, kind of similar to India, where you're born into a different, you know, stations and you're, you're stuck there. Um, so these are some really good, I think, comparisons to look out for if you're going to get maybe a short answer or long essay. And then, of course, the differences over here, location, although that's not really great, doesn't have a lot of to put into an essay. Um, but Europeans use their own people, right? So if you're in France, your peasants were French. The Spanish are going to use the conquered for encomienda and mita. So, you know, they wouldn't do this to their own Spanish. Although back in Spain, you're definitely going to have peasants and the remnants of feudalism going on there. Okay. All right. We're going to go a little bit of overtime. Um, now, this was an LEQ question. Uh, several years ago on the AP test, and it was develop an argument that analyzes changes in continuities in labor systems in, um, it offered either Latin America and the Caribbean or North, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean or North America. So I just kind of picked one for time's sake here. So, so something to think about would be, you know, how, how does the labor change in an area? And so if we go way back, Aztecs had slavery. Oh, Inca is not actually Latin America. Sorry about that. That's Peru. That's technically South America. Um, but you can still throw them in there. Um, the Spanish will create the encomienda. Um, the Spanish, well, let's just say our question was, you know, I don't know. Does that fit? Um, I don't remember my geography. 
we're going to go with the Americas. We're going to scratch out the Latin. We'll go with the Americas because um, I always, um, I like the Incas. But Spanish create the encomienda. Um, the Spanish modify that mita, but they bring them, actually they do bring the mita to Latin America. So they will practice that in Mexico and Belize and Honduras. So, um, and then another big kind of change is um, the bringing African slavery. So in, in Mexico, they're cool with the encomienda and the mita, but in, in your intense sugar colonies like Brazil, um, they're going to start to bring in the African slaves and also the Caribbean. And this is also why your slaves in Brazil were not freed until 1888, because they still wanted that labor supply for the sugar, for growing and processing sugar. Um, so these are kind of changes there and then continuities. There was always some kind of forced labor in the area, um, kind of a means of social stratification, right? Slaves were you know, on the bottom of the social pyramid with the Aztecs and then of course, you know, the indigenous, right? And they'll have um, kind of this caste system. And then we've got mostly indigenous labor doing that. Okay, and so if you wanna think about when you study, like look at some other areas and think about how those labor systems have changed or stayed the same, this would be a really great way to kind of um, make those big connections across time and and get ready for the writing. Okay, are there any questions? Sorry to keep y'all over the three minutes, or three minutes over. Okay, well, if there aren't any questions, um, I'll kind of stay in here. So if you wanna put anything in the chat, um, I can still respond to you, but thank you so much for tuning in to Labor Systems. Um, I've got my Twitter on there. If you um, want to follow me or just follow Fiveable would be awesome and get the latest updates. But thank you so much for spending your evening with me.